feel like when you're young, no one takes you seriously. We are the future. And in like 50 years, we're the ones that are going to have to deal with the decisions that are being made now. Oakland Unified faces up to $30 million in cuts. If I don't have the proper resources in the classroom, I get discouraged. Is your thumb over here going to make you? We still have policing in the school. Every time you act it up, you get sent somewhere and you end up falling into that school to prison pipeline. ICE officers do plan mass roundups targeting undocumented immigrants. When people think about undocumented people, they think about criminals and illegal. We're not an illegal alien, we are human beings. A lot of people that are in positions of power haven't come from the people that they're supposed to be helping. Generally, youth don't have a political voice. They aren't afforded that luxury of political clout. And it's sad because it's like, we want to live too. When we're talking about the voices of youth in the Central Valley, I feel one of the reasons that we don't feel heard is because we don't have outlets in which our voices can be heard. And I feel like the No is a really unique opportunity to kind of engage youth in journalism. So if you look in your red folders here, there is a sheet that walks you through creating your own personal narrative. What drove me to writing was I want to be a storyteller. I want to be able to use my platform to uplift others. I think the best thing I'm doing is just talking to people, making sure people know what's going on around them. So right now, a lot of my focus is taking those main issues that youth in Fresno most cared about and making podcasts about them. Hey guys, it's Sophia Trexler, 17 years old, and we're coming at you live from Fresno, California. And I'm Ray Mark Atacutan, I'm 19 years old, and you're listening to The Nose Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about young people, the future of our democracy, and what our generation is up against. So Gen Z and millennials make up the most diverse and largest living generations. We've grown up in a completely different world as opposed to, you know, boomers and Generation X. And I think now more than ever, we're faced with the task of dealing with the effects of the past generations, but also addressing the issues of the future and how we're going to go about solving these issues. And that all starts with education, and that's kind of hard to do when you look at the underfunded schools that we have in our country. Post-war in the United States, there's a generation growing up in a situation in which they don't immediately have to leave school. They're not threatened by a Great Depression. They're not immediately being drafted into a world war. And so there's time to actually have an adolescence. For middle-class white people, there's a real explosion of growth and prosperity. And then that contributed to a kind of sur suburban life for middle-class teenage youth that led to movements like the Beats and a kind of disenchantment with the materialism of the 1950s. It's important to realize that in the post-war period that this is a highly racially stratified system. At this time, tremendously racially restrictive housing practices and segregation, the emergence of suburbia that produced benefits for white America young people of color were understanding that they were being left out of the benefits and finding a need to struggle against injustice. Somebody like Barbara Johns, for example, her school in Virginia was one of the five schools that was put into the case for Brown versus the Board of Education. That was in 1951, and she was 15 years old. She organized a walkout at her school because her school facilities were so bad, they were teaching classes on buses. A lot of people point to the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960, which was young people, like 17, 18, 19-year-old, and that leading to the birth of the civil rights movement. We can see in the 60s that kind of that current of seeing a promise of, of freedom and a promise of liberation and then uh, contrasting that with the reality of what they're seeing in the country. There was Chicano uh, movement organizing in the 60s, like the 1968 blowouts. Certainly that was a place where high school students played a major role. The educational process of Mexican Americans for over 20 years in East Los Angeles and throughout the Southwest has been disrupted by its failure to communicate with the Mexican-American. That is the disruption. There's social injustice. One of the factors that has contributed to young people's ability to demand a seat at the table has been the decades of organizing, particularly organizing by people of color. 
the Black Panthers were around here in California. Asian Americans have been fighting for social justice. However, it's been the older white folks that have voted in large numbers, and this has resulted in a disinvestment and programs for young people. We the people, not the politicians, are still the boss. Proposition 13 will cut taxes in half, slash California's state income by $7 billion, and the brunt of the economies will be borne by schools. Stunned education officials describe the scale of the problem as completely crippling. We're seeing uh, the absolute collapse of a school system. And I remember the passage of Prop 13 in 1978, when our public libraries did reduce their hours. You know, you could see and feel a difference um, in your access to public services uh, as a kid. So I grew up in the California of the 1960s and 70s. And when I was growing up, I, mean, I remember like my elementary school had these science labs with microscopes. We went on field trips all the time. I participated in park and rec programs growing up that were free. But after we passed Proposition 13, which from that point on, you can trace a gradual disinvestment in schools. We can't turn our back on these students at a time as crucial as this. It is essential that our people remain united because we are the Oakland community. If y'all need funding, why don't you cut from the OPD, the Oakland Unified School Police Officers, because they're not making us. Skyline High School senior Jonathan Piper and other student leaders are worried because Oakland Unified faces up to $30 million in cuts. Oakland is a union town. Hundreds of teachers in Oakland hitting the picket lines for the second day of their strike. This is the largest gathering of the strike so far. They say cut back! We say Last year, um, during the teacher strike, a lot of the high school students were standing in solidarity with their teachers. We stand with Oakland teachers! Because they seen that their teachers were being unfairly compensated for their time, spending money out of their pockets for classroom materials. Rents are going up, our wages are not going up. We are the lowest paid teachers in the Bay Area. This is our living space. I don't make enough money. Our teachers wanted a raise because the cost of living increased and their ability to live comfortably in Oakland and teach in Oakland decreased. You know, students, we came and supported and we also voiced things that we needed, resources that we wanted. We didn't want our programs cut. We wanted more funding. And we're pretty much gonna educate you guys on the issues going on with our school system. How we want teachers that want to teach in Oakland. We want better transportation, especially being that we go to Skyline. That's one of the farthest schools because if only one of us says it, you're not gonna. It's not gonna work. If all of us come together and say it and make this a demand, I feel like this can happen. The students went as far as to organize their own walkout and teaching um, in school where they also talked about how it is that students could get involved with that fight. Step to the side, step to the side, are you on our teacher's side? They even organized their own sick out day where 96% of high school students didn't show up that day and had 400 and more students along with adult allies literally march down Broadway from Oakland Tech and showed their support. We will stop the school. A lot of things went on in the protest. It was a lot of picketing, a lot of shouting, a lot of organizing meetups, a lot of meetings, definitely. But organizing in this generation could be done so differently. Technology is moving at such a rapid pace. I feel old, but they're experts at it. And they could use those social media platforms to engage, to educate, and to organize and to mobilize a lot of their peers, right? Even if they don't want to come out to an action, they could still do an education moment in less than 30 seconds. It was like a lot of youth stepping up and putting themselves in these roles to fight these inequalities in the school and educational system. Hi, my name is Dukasha. I'm a ninth grade student at Skyline High School, and I stand with my Oakland teachers. I support Measure G because I grew up in these communities. I understand the struggle that young people face day in and day out. Join us and vote yes on Measure G. And now we're 
essentially in the last seconds of the, the initiative with the ballot coming up. Building this coalition, seeing it grow has been amazing and I am just grateful to be here and, 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 and blessed to even be breathing and having a voice for folks that maybe cannot speak. We're literally just having a conversation about getting more money for you. That's it. You know, this is, this is game time, so. Let's get it. Let's get it, yes. <laughs>elevating the funding for, for youth in opposing Measure G. If Measure G passes, it will, yes, provide real funding for ongoing youth programs, but would, I fear, squeeze out the other priorities, including affordable housing. And what it is I'm grappling with is the mayor of this city to try to make sure that we don't forsake any one key priority for any other key priority. In Sacramento, Measure G would require the city to set aside an estimated $12 million a year for new youth programs. The hook is that additional money would go into something called a Sacramento Children's Fund, which would be overseen by a new commission of 17 different people, all of them non-elected. Critics call this ballot box budgeting. I absolutely believe that young people have to have a much stronger voice the tension is whether or not they, anybody other than the elected officials should have uh, the decision making. I do believe that ultimately the decision for how to spend public resources should be left with the people who have been entrusted uh, by the voters to make those decisions. Our opponents will hold up, hold up the fact that young people serve on this commission as a negative. Now, in our view, it's a positive because if you want to design programs that really serve youth, you have to get input from young people. They have to be part of the design. Otherwise, you design something that adults think work for young people. 20 plus organizations uh, that came together and was like, this is what the city, what the youth in our city need. Essentially, the mayor wants to spend money on youth, but in a more conservative way. That's not what we're here for. Um, I would go towards after school programs, job training for teenagers, preventing youth homelessness, and a lot of really great things that we need. I try to get this message out to the core group and, and, and in general that none of that matters. Like, we got here without their support. We're gonna win this without their support. We're gonna stay consistent on the ground, keep doing our work, don't pivot, and we're gonna get it done. Do you think we can count on yep, your support? You awesome. We're going to both vote for that. Love it. I appreciate it. You win something like this, the benefits are bigger than me. I'm not winning $12 million, $15 million. The city gets to the youth, my potential kids in the future. If we win this campaign, we will shape the future of Sacramento. Then the youth have the power to do that. You know, the city of Sacramento spends millions of dollars each year on police misconduct settlements. The city subsidizes private developments. The city just committed $33 million to help build a soccer arena here in town. To bring major league soccer to Sacramento. So we think that the city uh, could easily find 2.5% of its budget to invest in youth. And we think that in order to change the dynamic, we have to essentially force the city to rethink its priorities.
Public school teachers in Oakland, California today reached a tentative agreement to end an eight-day strike. Today's tentative agreement would give teachers an 11% pay raise over the next four years and a 3% bonus. So the teachers got their raise, but the extracurricular activities that we as students have in our schools were, you know, basically cut because the teachers wanted their raise. <laughs> Students yelled at the school board after they voted to cut $21.75 million. The cuts will eliminate the restorative justice program, gut an Asian Pacific Islander support program, lay off all five foster youth case managers, and take money away from school libraries. But I think what ended up coming out was the power dynamics that we got to see in trying to shut down the students and looking at young people like they don't know anything and looking at young people like they don't have power to make uh, the changes necessary to improve our school district. We were supposed to be equal and, you know, in the strike together. I don't even want to talk about it. It's going to anger me because at first I was like, don't nobody care about that. They should have kept going. But I guess you learn. Sacramento is really diverse. All types of different folks from all over. We're essentially a melting pot. I grew up in a single uh, parent household, grown up in a all female household as well, living with my grandmother, my mom. My other side of the family, I live in a different part of the city with you know some of the gang culture that we have here. It's heavy in these streets. Cousins that were in gangs and seeing the disparities. I was able to live different lives. The revolution is in your mind. I used to sit and fantasize about broken ties and pacify. Now so I decided, you know, I want to make change in my community because I know there's things that shouldn't be. You can't do anything until that track Music is taken out. and politics to me are the same thing. I'm on a stage speaking my message over a beat or I'm on stage speaking my message over a podium trying to affect change. All right. What's up, bro? What's up, man? How you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm chilling, good. man. I'm chilling. Yep. <laughs> Gotta get fresh. This is yeah, a pretty yeah. big day, you know? Just trying to stay on point when it comes yeah. to this community work too. I actually started getting involved with like organizing off of a phone banking campaign where they had us call folks asking, do you believe that Sacramento should spend more of its budget on youth services? Yes? Okay, thank you. Next. At some point I was like, um, how do we actually make this happen? And I stumbled across Sacramento Kids First meeting they're talking about the Sacramento Children's Fund initiative. We've been talking to the city council members. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to the mayor I'm about this fund that we're trying to build here. A you know, fund? Yeah, so we're trying to build up strong youth and, and provide them an environment to where they can thrive and create a better environment for the next generation. Sacramento Children's Fund will generally fund services that foster the healthy growth of a child from ages 0 to 24. Um, that can include preventing youth homelessness. That can include job trainings, after school programs, art programs. I love it because this isn't one or two organizations looking for a money grab. This is 20 plus organizations that come together to say, this is what the city needs. Jesus Franco. Hey, uh, my name is Jay Franco, Jesus Franco. I'm going to need everyone that's supporting SAC Kids First, go ahead and stand up. Can you just tell the numbers? We believe the children and youth of Sacramento deserve the best and that we should do the best by them. I've been a part of Measure U, Measure G, Measure Y. I've been trying to do everything I can in this city to make sure that something gets pushed for the youth. There are after school programs that kids need that aren't being built. College Track has helped me 
see that I do want to go to college at a time when I didn't feel like I could go to college because of what statistics say about low income minority students. Crazy how there's a little amount of schools, but there's a lot of prisons built for just for us. There are proposed schools to be closed right now. There are proposed jails to be expanded right now. Uh, we need to show our dedication to the youth. And basically, this is how the, your constituents want to do it. We are here to put SAC kids first. It felt good. I feel like we have a really good chance of getting on the March ballot. And um, we'll see you next week. We'll be back. Council members, I'm Sarah Michael Gaston with Youth Forward and the SAC Kids First Coalition. I would like to present again the petition asking you to place this measure on the March ballot. 51,000 signatures. Uh, these folks did a lot of work. I felt that they laid a, a, a very thoughtful plan about why it's essential for them to have it on that March ballot. All right, the main motion to put this on the March ballot. Please call the roll. Councilmember Harris? Yes. Councilmember Chenier? Councilmember Guerra, yeah. Councilmember Carr, yes. and Mayor Steinberg. Yes. Very good. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being active leaders in your community. Makes a difference. Okay. That was such a victory because it felt so good to actually get something on the ballot out of that work. And this is where the real work starts. We got a fight ahead of us, and um, I think we're ready to go. Here's a little story I got to tell about the South LA program you don't know so well. Called the Community Coalition. Here's the mission. Fix our schools in the city's condition. Well, I started getting involved in my community in middle school. I joined the Labor Community Strategy Center. Patrice Colors helped organize me. She helped start Black Lives Matter. Women, they all helped organize me starting off. I ended up transitioning going to a community coalition in ninth grade when I went to high school. And I think going to these community-based organizations really helped me foster that growth of being a leader and an organizer in the community. Room 190 thing, I think that kind of sparked something to talk about doing less punitive things to young people, find more restorative practices for young people that was getting pushed out. And I had some of the organizers, the lead organizers, that helped support me as far as language and what that should look like, how to approach the principle, the way you do things in order to get something done. Drafted it. I remember standing really late at Community Coalition. My boy Tono Yendu, they one of the youth organizers there, a little dope cat. And we drafted the first Bill of Rights. So essentially, it's uh, what we've coined as a school climate bill of rights. It's a comprehensive set of reforms that is focused on really prioritizing the use of positive approaches to school discipline. Where can we establish that relationship between a teacher and that student to be able to? sit down and be like, what's going on? How can we help you? How can I better support you as a teacher to help you, you know? I want to start by walking you guys through a, a day in the life as a young man in South Central Los Angeles. Across the street to make my way to school, I see police cars parked out front with other police officers on foot and patrol cars roaming the surrounding area on the campus. Ask yourself, how can we truly be expected to achieve at a high academic level when we are experiencing conditions that are more like a prison and less like a school? I appreciate going through that journey of uh, doing the work, flying out, talking to Senate folks or school districts and all of that, and um, really trying to implement it. So that was a journey in itself, getting folks aligned with, uh, with the mission. Every student matters to me because we should have an equal opportunity to maximize our potential, right? Right? Welcome, Blue Shirts. My name is Damian Valentine. I am a sophomore at Manual Arts and proud member of Community Coalition and Brother Sun Cells Coalition. I am here to support the School Climate Bill of Rights. And LAUSD, Latino students are twice as likely to be suspended than whites. And African Americans are six times as likely. Our schools need real alternatives that support students. This School Climate Bill of Rights is the first step to achieving that. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to buy because they, uh, there's a word called consequence. But I'm not going to give you permission to go and act crazy and think there are no consequences to your behavior. And I'm going to vote no. This to me is not about a pass to behave inappropriately. It's about how we as a system respond disproportionately when we see behavior in our schools. 
What I have seen is that the consequences in a restorative justice model actually work. Expecting great things, I'm a yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Because of all the work that you all put in here today, from the students from Community Coalition, from Labor Community Strategy Center, from Inner City Struggle, all your work culminated here today with a 5-2 vote. Now we it was a long battle. It took two years to pass. I mean, to think about two years, a lot can happen in two years uh, as far as life is concerned. I think it gave us uh, more hope, more faith to keep continuing on to do the work, do the groundwork, to get other policies put into play. And I, I realize that if you want change, it takes time. Yes, young people may not necessarily be able to vote, but that doesn't mean they can't have an impact on the political process. It doesn't mean that they can't have an impact on the ways in which policies, laws, and practices are changed and remade. As a generation, I feel like we've reached this consciousness that it's all right to be disruptive. It's all right to not be civil when, you know, kids are in cages and our friends are being deported and like we are being saddled with all of these problems that like we didn't create. But part of that is also realizing that liberation and our quest for equality and equity, that's going to be a constant struggle that we fight throughout our lives. The majority of our population comes from um, immigrant families. We have a lot We of usually provide Know Your Rights trainings and forums to our community members. Also, we put candidates' forums together for city council and for school board. Um, I would advocate for youth programs, especially more youth leadership programs, because I think that's something we really need in our city. So I think for us, it's very important to create that space of possibilities for undocumented people of like, you do have a voice and you do have some form of power. It might not be the voting power that you need or want, but you definitely can make a, a difference. I'm a lot around environmental justice. Yeah. Environmental justice. And it's like by coming together, bringing in the knowledge, sharing it, that's to me organizing that's bringing change which means like when we learn, we teach someone else. Hi, my name is Sophia. I'm from the No Media. Is it okay if I drop off a couple copies of our paper? Yeah. Right. Journalism kind of just became a natural extension of the activism and causes that I was already supporting and doing. Have a nice day. Knowledge is power. So I feel like when people have knowledge, they're more empowered to make choices. Organizing is not just the work of individualism, definitely not. You need community, you need everybody. You need dogs, <laughs> cats, I mean, come on, like, you can't do organizing without community. Uh, I feel like for so long, America has been defined by this individualist mindset where it's like, me, me, me. My rights matter over everyone else's. Like, my personal liberties matter. Like, But our generation has focused on sort of like forging that path together to achieve like collective change. The best thing we can do is prepare the next generation to you know, fight back. We're not letting certain boundaries like define us anymore or divide us. As long as people are talking, as long as that conversation is there, then there's going to be people like pushing in the movement. And young people are gonna be at the front line of that every single time. I think students really got fed up when the adult allies that they stood in solidarity with let them down hundred young people came together and decided that they needed power. And one of the ways to get power was to have 16-year-olds being able to have the right to vote for their school board officials. So that's the reason why we're engaged with Expand the Vote to 16. 
Oakland Youth Boat is a movement led by young leaders in Oakland. And one of our steps is to expand voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds when it comes to their school board elections here in Oakland. Youth under the age of 18 are making vital contributions to society every day. But we're not done. We're gonna keep going and we're gonna keep fighting because that's what we do. For the past four years, I've been involved in a win, lose, or whatever. The biggest takeaway is going to be building that coalition and understanding the power of the people that came together and how do we pivot.